Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, as has been said by everybody else this evening, not only has it been quite an evening with all this technology, <laughs> but it's been quite a year. And 2020, of course, is not over yet. Um, we started with fire in, in uh, California and Australia, flood, and then the, the terrible pandemic. All things that are tied up with the environment and tied up with our mistreatment of the environment, including the pandemic, which is all sorts of things about eating the wrong things and globalization, these problems. So this year really has been, they talk about the year of the environment, but it wasn't the way it was intended. It's the, year, the biggest crisis in the environment in history, I think, and one of the biggest crises for humanity. And suddenly people are realizing that the two are deeply entwined, and that includes nature and uh, conservation and wildlife and landscapes. So I shall introduce myself briefly. I'm a landscape architect and ecologist who spent his life working with engineers and developers. So I've lived on the barbed wire between nature conservation and development, which is something which, of course, we need if we're to survive, get food and clothes, all the things, cars, all the ghastly things we need, but somehow trying to make that less dreadful is what I've done in my life. Um, and in my old age, of course, the thing has got jacked up even more. And we're going to talk about climate emergency, river engineering, and nature conservation, um, and especially flooding. So here we have a beautiful day in the Caribbean. Isn't it lovely? But trouble is afoot. Here is um, where I went. I've been working all over the world for the last 30 years uh, until I retired here to Rutland. Um, and I went out in 1999, work on um, hurricane damage. And that was my eye opener to climate change. I have never seen anything quite like it. Um, there were houses that were really our islands were split in two. Uh, houses were demolished. Um, I remember see, meeting a man who stood on the rubble of his home, um, holding his child above his head as the waves, the backwash of the waves from a hurricane, you get this backwash, came pouring in. Um, and you couldn't believe it. It was, it was staggering. And until you see what climate change can do, it's hard to imagine it from the films. Um, and I went, so I went out in, and then 20 years later, the same place, which was the worst place on Abaco in the Bahamas, was hit again because the government didn't move the poorest people out of the most vulnerable housing, which was below sea level, and it hit the same place all over again. One of the things about climate change is that mostly, it's pretty indiscriminate in some many ways, but the poor have it worst. So, all this is the grim bit, so we, I'll get through the more cheerful stuff. You have to wade through the horror of the environmental crisis first. Um, climate change obviously worse than flooding. This is the Somerset level floods in 2014. And um, you've also had floods in Leicestershire. I've uh, worked on the saw over the years. Nothing as dramatic as Somerset, of course, but very serious, serious stuff. And then we've had more and more of it, haven't we? With last um, spring, absolutely dreadful. So all these things have come pouring in and I wrote this book Taming the Flood 35 years ago and God, it certainly hasn't been tamed for sure. Um, now a slightly calmer image. So what is what makes flooding worse? Um, what are the issues? I discovered all about it when I turned up in the Seven Trent Water Authority in 1977 as a young man. And I was a landscape architect, ecologist, and I thought I'd be planting trees around offices for the water board, basically. And I was rung up on the first week by a river engineer who said, you're our new greeny bloke. Would you please come and help me? I've got a woman tied to a tree. Would you please persuade her to untie herself so I can chop it down and then um, I can get on with sorting out the flooding. So this ungrateful woman and her, her house with the garden going down to the river is, is not flooded in future. That was my job, to persuade her to untie herself from the said willow tree. So I went out and that was the day that changed my life. 
because I found out about all these problems. Now, this is a confusing picture because it's a painting. It's Millet's painting of the drowning Ophelia from Hamlet, and she's floating off down the river. But the Pre-Raphaelites who painted were very keen on nature and they were very precise in their, in their observation of nature. So actually it's one of the best images I know of, which shows the kind of things that we love, the natural things, which give a headache to river engineers. So from the back top left, you see a willow tree about to fall into the river and block it. And in the middle is a lovely dog rose, and you can see it's dangling over the edge of the channel. And so it's going to catch any dead dogs, supermarket trolleys and other things as they bob down in the flood and further block it. And then to the right, you can just about make out a teasel growing in the, in the eroding bank. So the bank's slipping and falling in. And in the foreground, lots of beautiful waterweeds, branch, burrweed, crowfoot, all holding the, the watercourse up and making a problem. So, of course, forgetting about poor old Ophelia, who might just be the lady officer from the Wildlife Trust, who's been hurled in after a serious argument, we find this is what the engineers do to the channel, or did, and they still do, of course. You remove all those things, like the willow trees and, and the dog roses, because they are a problem. And um, they are seen as, uh, so the way to deal with it is to blast forward and deal with it. And that is what happened all over the country when I was starting this business um, on the flood stuff. And the land drainage, as it was called, um, it wasn't called flood defense because at that time it was all run by farmers because agriculture had always suffered very understandably, terribly from flooding, still does. And the idea was to get the water down through the channel, put banks at the top of this channel, there'll be banks raised so that the, um, so that the, the water is kept neatly inside the banks, hurling it down to the downstream towns, which is what's been happening in our new floods, because the rivers have been designed back over the last 60 years, really to deal with, with agricultural rural flooding. And when you get to the towns, the picture is no cheerier you get these dismal streams, this is a stream. And that woman who tied herself to the willow tree was talking about something different to this. She was talking about picnics and wind in the willows and all those un, uh, undefinable, enjoyable things, which were part of the definition of a river. So for the old fashioned engineers, I should hasten to say that's not so much now, it was just about how you measured the volumes of water. And this is a very efficient way of measuring, getting water out. And as a consequence, all over the world, this was done. And here is a, is a watercourse when I was working in Papua New Guinea. And there it is with the um, uh, hideous concrete banks, also the crinkly tin shed, there'll probably be a McDonald's behind it. And it, you could really be in darkest, urban edge London uh, or anywhere else. So that's what's happened. The whole world has become to look the same in many, many different ways through the pressures, unintentional pressures of development on landscape. Now, this is where the cheery bit starts. So sorry you had to endure the problem. This is the solution. So what we found in those cheerful days between us, the, the lady was untied from her tree and the engineer sat down to look at the problem. And um, we realized that we didn't have to flatten the place. You could lower the level of the watercourse, but not turn it into one of those dreadful drains that we've seen. You could plant new trees. You had to keep some trees out of the way. And here, the, the digger, which was the destroyer in that earlier picture, is transplanting water forget-me-not and burr reed to put into a new lovely margin on the edge. And then he will go on to make a pond rather than filling the ponds in with the dredging, make new ones, and you could turn the whole thing on its head, um, provided you got buy-in from the landowners and the engineers were happy. And, and this was a, a story about making things work, working with nature, um, but you did need to manage it. It wasn't just let it go completely wild because we're a highly populated country. So this was a great story and you could take it even further. And here, as you took it, this is a, an old German example. This is a straightened channel put in 
most conveniently for my argument by Adolf Hitler. He did lots of this dreamy stuff. Um, uh, and the, in the 70s and 80s, the, the Bavarian Water Authority stanked off the Strait Channel and put the whole river back. And this is another major point about all this, that you can do things in development well or badly. We're going to come back to this time and again, well or badly. So you can do it thoughtfully or you could do it straight channel unthoughtfully. And I found as I worked around the world that you could do palm oil plantations thoughtfully or dreadfully. And I've done an awful lot of motorways. And I ended up doing a motorway where we removed six miles of motorway and put it under the hill where it was an outstanding nature reserve and turned it into a tunnel and restored the whole thing. So that was a road equivalent of this, which is, you know, the way to do things. is isn't always done this way, of course. So that's the engineering, it's turning it on its head and thinking about it and dealing with it. The land use is even more of an issue. Um, so we could, we could, the engineers were great, they came to think about it, but you're left with land use. And this is where the big, big story is in this country, and I think in Leicestershire, is the rural farmed landscape. And here it is, this is not Leicestershire, this is near the Moldens, but it's still Midlands. Um, and you can see, isn't it gorgeous? The farmers were the great savers and creators of the British landscape, as is so often said. However, this one is a Leicestershire farm at Orton on the Hill. Um, and it was taken 30 years ago. And I believe it's just the same. I did Google it and there was a modern picture of it, just the same. Um, I may be corrected by those who live there. Um, but that is a terrible thing to do. So the landscape, those little trees in the middle of those arable fields are remnants of hedges because no farmer would plant a tree in the middle of a field around. So that gorgeous landscape has been mute really for intensive monoculture. And that's the worst thing I've found wherever I've worked all over the world. The very important thing to say is, one may moan about this in agriculture, but there are still plenty of good farmers who do things very thoughtfully and beautifully. And I've met more and more, I'm still meeting them, um, who love their landscape and don't want it to be like that. And we have a role to guide that way of managing land. And it isn't just because of its beauty or its wildlife. It's also practical because what you find in terms of the flooding, it wasn't just the channels which were sending water down to the towns, but it was also the, um, it is also these enormous cereal crops, these big farm landscapes have actually meant a lot of farmers have gone out of business. Many, many small farmers have gone out of business as it's taken over by big agribusiness. Though there are plenty of good ones, I must keep saying, also around. Um, and what that's done, that has, those big machines, they, they're harvesting there, but they will plow it. And the pan, the ground is so cons consolidated by these enormous machines that when the rain hits the surface, it can't go in. It flows over the top and down to the rivers. And all the topsoil is washed down, precious topsoil every year from this, from upstream, down it goes. And that's why you get such muddy boots. And so that is a bad story. Now here is a, a different approach. So people with this crisis have been thinking about doing things differently. And this is Honicut, which is a, a National Trust owned uh, estate uh, on the edge of Exmoor, which rises on the moorland. The, the, the whole, they own the land from the top of the watershed to the bottom. This is a very short fall from the edge of Exmoor down to the sea, and they happen to own the whole parcel. So it was a very good site to choose to do this kind of pioneering experiment, really. So what they, the National Trust did, they looked at this and they looked at from top to bottom to hold the water back. So instead of just pouring it off, which the old days, the tops were ploughed and so on, um, and all this kind of thing to, to improve marginal drainage for sheep. Um, and now they were stanking back the top. And then as the stream runs down, they would block it off with branches and trunks and things, something that in my day, the engineers would have killed me if I tried to put 
trees across a water course. Um, but no, they do that to hold it back. And you see, it's not upsetting anybody in that valley. It's, it's quite steep sided. And then right at the bottom, they broke the flood banks um, in critical places. So the old floodplain could then be flooded by the river at peak times. And it was only livestock. They didn't try and grow cereals on it so they could know the rain was coming, move the cattle and sheep off, the land would come to water, bet the, bet the animal, get the animals back on, and the thing kind of worked. Now, it only works by agreement. So the National Trust was lucky. They owned the land. And even then, and this is Nigel Hester, the bloke who, who did this scheme for the National Trust, their, their conservation guy. Um, and he worked with all the tenants. And the first thing that the National Trust did with the tenants was to reduce their rent. They realized that they couldn't expect the tenants to be flooded out. So they reduced the rent and that was a way of, it was okay then. The, the, the farmers weren't, weren't worse suffering because they didn't have so much rent to pay. And that was what was done. So in other situations, somehow the money has to be found if you're going to, the water has to go somewhere. <laughs> and this, this is the problem. Um, so basically, it was very good, very successful. And in 2013, they put all the telemetry in so they could measure it, so they knew what they were doing. It wasn't just guesswork. And there you have 160,000 um, pounds worth of interventions with those branches and the odd flood bank, and they've got 30 million property assets saved. And on Christmas Eve, the flood came pouring down and it lapped up to the lower doorsteps of the lowest houses in the villages and it worked. So that was just shows how you can do it. I just remember the thing, you can do things well or badly. And so often doing it well is being moderate and let, taking a little bit more for the, for the natural side. Don't expect to go completely wild, but just that kind of approach. And here you have on the River Saw in Leicestershire, um, the Trust showpiece site at Narborough Bog, which has just gone through 2019 to 20, which is doing exactly the same thing. I don't think, obviously you can't do it from source to, to sea because you haven't only got a bit of the saw there to deal with, but a brilliant project and absolutely great. Good to see um, the Wildlife Trust doing this on the saw, which is a river years ago I, um, I worked on, but I, I don't, I'm not up to date with this now. Um, so there, that's a great thing. And another thing about the Narborough Bog is that it's peat. And peat is another very, very precious thing, marvellous for dragonflies and um, also and here at cotton grass. This is this is down at Thorn Moors in near Doncaster, a site which has now been restored. It was stripped out for uh, horticultural peat, almost lost, and then after a big campaign, saved in 2004. And it's now back in all its glory. And the other really important thing about peat is that it's a carbon sink. So if you dig it out, um, the carbon goes up in the atmosphere, worsening um, climate change. If you preserve it, it's, it's, it, it grows and it absorbs the CO2. So that's also a good aspect about the Narbonne Bog Scheme and the great project to do. So, remember him. We've almost forgotten Mr. Cameron. This is a, this is a cartoon from the, uh, the days of uh, uh, the Somerset levels, um, uh, flood, the Somerset floods in 2014 um, in, the, in the times. And do notice the clever way he's done the reflection in the water with Cameron so sympathetic to the poor people flooded and then victorious in the reflection. Um, so basically that was a beginning of a turning point. And now we have um, the agriculture bill going through parliament as from December last year. Um, it isn't over yet, people are arguing over it, but one really hopes there is an opportunity here and that there are opportunities for a, a change in the way we manage the landscape. Um, you have um, real proposals to, to bring in um, environmental benefits. And there's a big talk, it's not won't be through until 2026, but something called ELMS, E-L-M-S in capitals, which stands for Environmental Land Management Schemes. One of these pompous expressions, but it's very important. Uh, 
and it will be a way of paying farmers, not just to farm in Kent. Um, there are real problems um, with farming now, of course. Um, the uh, Brexit means that they are losing the common agricultural payment scheme, which is um, three billion a year, and um, it's 53% approx of farm income. So every time the farmer makes a pound, he gets that extra 53 pence from what is the European Union. That, of course, is going with Brexit. And in many ways, the CAP has been the engine of destruction over the decades of my working life. But because it has been indiscriminate, it has not been moderate. Instead of talking about carefully thinking, doing it well, you just filled in the form and you put your area of acreage or hectareage, and then you got the payment. So you could go on doing agribusiness intensive forever and you still got the money. So the change of that, and there's a lot of talk of this now and there's been talk of it more and more, and Boris Hutchwood, miracle, miracle, maybe, really getting on with some of this environmental stuff um, to, to put the money to reward, which is coming from the public purse, to reward the public. Um, so that is one thing. They're losing the cap. But then they're also going to lose a lot of um, income, very probably, because the protection is no longer there. Because what you'll find is there'll be cheaper imports. It's always been cheaper to, to import food from overseas. People think it isn't, but it's always been that. Even in the Victorian times, cheap wheat coming in from America will always be British wheat. Um, so that those are real worries, and it's a terrible worry for many farmers. But I also think it is an opportunity for the landscape if we manage it here. And if that isn't enough of a worry for or, or, or a catalyst for change in the landscape. Look at this. Now, this may upset some of you. This is honey. This is laboratory grown food. And it, it's another Leicestershire pioneer because Leicestershire, the village of corn, uh, gave its name to corn, the food substitute, which is a protein grown, uh, I understand, through fungi in, in water tanks. And that was came through in 1985. And you'll find it on the shelves of supermarkets. Um, vegetarians eat corn stuff a lot. Um, but the thing is, now that's really coming very fast. So whether one likes it or not, we now have the Impossible Burger, which arrived in 2016. And I have a vegan friend who, who tried it, because it's not made from meat. Um, and she didn't like it because it was so convincingly like a burger, unlike meat. So it's quite a convincing thing, quite expensive still to do, but there's changing very fast. And that is done through cell division. And I mean, it's very complicated, all this, and I can't give you the nuts and bolts. The other mo most promising way is by through yeasts. And that will, that is likely, is starting to happen. Now, if you think about that, this is the greatest land use revolution since in the fertile crescent of Mesopotamia, the earliest civilizations started to grow cereals in 9,000 BC. And suddenly, we're no longer growing it. Now, this has various issues, and, and it will be, it'll have lots of problems, but again, it could be an opportunity. I don't think anyone expects all food to be grown in a laboratory, but quite a lot could be. And the cereals that you feed to livestock, they won't complain about the taste. That's one of the worries. Everyone says, oh, they wouldn't touch it because it's revolting. But if they're given, given a synthetically produced protein, that's, uh, th that would mean it would be done in a thing like a brewery, which is a largish but not enormous building, uh, rather than in hundreds of square miles of intensive cereals. So you really are looking at potentially huge, mind-bending changes coming in the next five to ten years so big big changes to the landscape and um, opportunities and the other thing about this is it is no longer possible to say as has always been said by the agricultural industry that we have to what they call in in yorkshire plow to the tarmac you know that picture of autumn on the hill because otherwise we'll starve to death because we need lots of food 
So if you can grow some food in a civilized, in, in this way, and some food in a civilized way, so you can serve your beautiful Leicester Shashik producing delicious lamb and all that kind of thing in, a, in the traditional way, hopefully, they, I mean, who knows, but it is, it's very interesting. What it does, it gives even more power to the, the thoughtful, the good ways in which land has been managed by agriculture and by farmers. This is an absolutely brilliant place, which I thoroughly recommend anyone wants to go and see it. It's just on the, just on the western side of Uppingham, um, on the road towards Leicester. And it's run by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, EWCT. Uh, it's marvelous because they are not doing folksy, back to nature stuff. They're real hard headed cereal farmers and they make a profit. They have to make a the whole point is to show they can make a profit. They're not, not you know, they're not a wildlife trust site that's that's run by, you know, there to, for wildlife. They, they have to be commercial farmers. And what they've done, they've set aside land. You see the land in the foreground. They've kept the hedges. They use the wood from the hedges for their fuel, for their wood boilers to heat things. They have beetle banks. They have endless, endless things. They also have open days. And it's brilliant. It shows that you can do it. You can actually do the hard headed stuff and have a compromise whereby it's not all absolutely flattened under an intensive monoculture. And as you get more efficient and um, not at the wildlife, that's, so that's a modified version. What you've just seen, that's a modified version to the standard version. And I think that's going to be the main thing that will probably come. Um, the rewilding schemes are more exciting, but they're, they're inevitably going to be less universal because you have to own a lot of land for that. This is a rewilding scheme, which I've been involved with for 30 years, which is at Wickham Fen. And it's um, a, a wetland near Cambridge, very, very famous. And um, what we've done, we've doubled the site in the last, since 2000, um, by buying very valuable, raising money, buying very valuable, um, peat, um, plough land that was growing carrots and turning it into wetland. The concept of this was that we already had the core, which was the last undrained bit of fen going, that was saved in the late 19th century and bought by the trust, the National Trust. Uh, and so the idea is if you've got the best bits and there's their little islands in this enormous intensive land use of other other farming and sometimes in urban areas, what you do is you um, you look at those areas as a priority to expand. And the concept um, is now the, the buzzword that's used nowadays and pushed by Natural England is nature recovery networks, which actually is quite a good buzzword because at least you can understand by just hearing it, what it more or less means, unlike some of these expressions. And so there you go. Um, that is now expanding and marvelous and steadily growing. And this is another one. It doesn't have to be wet, it can be woods. So just across the Welland into Northamptonshire, I'm now much in, involved with the very dawning of a project where we hope to link the gorgeous ancient woodlands together. This is a, a wild aquilegia, a columbine growing in a wonderful wood called the Bedford Hurleys, which is just the other side of the, the wellers, so just not in your, your Rutland County quite. And we're starting to look at opportunities, and there's a huge interest in actually doing the same with the woods as we did with the wet, starting with the core, brilliant areas, and that's, they've been lost over the years. And um, well, there's a lot of them still there, but they're, they're gaps. So they need, you fill in the gaps. It'll take a long time. We don't know what the farmers are going to say. We've got to find out who's interested. Some will be, some won't be, but we're getting huge interest from Natural England and it's all looking kind of really promising. So there's another nature recovery network, which could be brilliant and would be a priority, particularly with planting trees being very popular now for the CO2. And let's hope it's not always just planting Sitka spruce in Scotland, which seems to be a depressing way of capturing CO2. Linking some of these woods, fabulous. And tying that to, to 
the, the populations in Corby who come out to enjoy it, and the populations in Leicester who come up. Lots of people come out from Leicester to find shade in those areas. Um, and there are opportunities, obviously, in Rutland and Leicestershire. The Lee Forest near where I live, just south of Oakham, is another one more splintered than this, but, but with potential. Um, and so always looking at trying to, it's this determination I have, okay, cereal's useful and you need it, but this intensive, massive it everywhere that you see, you look out the window from your train or your car, you're looking for opportunities. And some of the best sites that I've seen since I've been the last two years here are the quarries um, and the quarries in, in Rutland, marvellous sites. I think this one is Hetton, um, but there are a lot of others and they're very good wildflowers. But I've been helping the trust because we've, I found, you wouldn't believe it, that there's some quarries with 20, 20 foot more, 20 metre high cliffs. And they're still from the old arrangements planning to put cereals in these quarries. I mean, they don't even work. So we've been really getting involved with that and trying to say, don't do it. And where in the past the trust has worked really well and overturned such proposals, you've got some really good reserves, um, both on the granite down in the Charlton Forest and in, in the lithic limestone up here in, in Rutland. So that's another great opportunity. So just as we, we coast down to the end of this, um, it has, it is, it is, it is, it is a revolution. It is at historic times. And um, of course, people have been listening to um, Stephen Moss, the, the broadcaster, has been overwhelmed with having to be interviewed and listened to on radio talking about the bird of the week and this and that. It's all been just, there has been a, an enormous feeling about wildlife increased. And also, I think very much the feeling that the, the crisis is upon us and we need to care about the environment more. So you in the Wildlife Trust here are in a very important place. And then the wildlife itself has actually cheered up because there's nothing like everyone going home and staying put to cheer them up. We've had nightingale singing. You could hear them where I live in Eggleton, outside the reserve, singing, belting their hearts out as we walked along the path outside the, 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 the Rutland Water Reserve. And um, there's been a, a wick and fen, which I described. The marsh harriers um, have been nesting. They're very, um, they're very inconsiderate birds. They've been nested right by the visiting visitor center when it was all locked down. So of course, what did we do when we had to reopen it? That was a problem. Um, but um, my daughter in, in Melbourne, in Australia, tells me that kangaroos have been walking down the main centre of Melbourne. And I went out with friends to Mary's Meadow, which is a lovely site of, of the Rutland Trust, um, Rutland and Leicestershire Trust, up um, in North Rutland, near the A1, to look at the orchids and the, the curlews were breeding. So that hadn't been seen before, I don't think, for a long time. No, you may correct in that on that side. So, it, it, it's, it, you, you've got to look at hopefulness and nothing more hopeful than nature. What I say is that nature is its best advocate. Many of the planning committees that I've seen um, who have sat and listened to the lectures in the committee room and looked at reports, not know, is it worth saving this? Get them out on site, wade them through the mud, get them parting the branches and the reeds and look at a place and they come back with fresh determination in their eyes to save a site that's just seemed not worth the trouble when discussed in, in abstract. And I always remember working in my river days, probably in Leicestershire on, on the saw, I, I don't remember which river, um, uh, with a farmer saying, please leave that meander so it doesn't get filled in. Go on, just sacrifice that little bit of land um, and it will be so lovely. Uh, and um, he wasn't so sure. And then the Kingfisher flew down the, the river, a spark of blue. And he turned to me and said, OK, you win, Mr. Burstglove. And that bird sealed our bargain. So that's my book, if anyone's interested, which is out uh, and about now. And it's got much more stuff about overseas as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, we've definitely had a few questions coming up as well. If Good. you're happy, yeah, pick up some. 
Fantastic. Now, I mean, one of the ones that came up and you started to talk about there towards the end was about tree planting um, yeah. and flood management. And there's certainly, yeah, there's one group in Harbour who specifically asked a question there on chat. So I was just wondering if you had any particular yeah. advice, you know, there's a lot of conversations in conservation, obviously, at the moment. There's a lot of, you know, Prime Minister's been pushing again. Um, yeah, yeah. In the right places. What, what's going to help, I suppose, on the flooding agenda side of things, but also be best for nature in general? Well, the tree planting thing is is very important. And it's the top of catchment is the place to go. Um, uh, I went to look at Pickering, which was a Yorkshire site where they were using forestry there. Um, so the answer is yes, do tree plant up the headwaters. I, a lot of tree planting is going in and I mean, you can't stop it. And it's, it has its role in terms of Sitka spruce forestry, which I think is a shame. I would much prefer to see broadleaves deciduous and those, and I can't see why they can't also be harvested at times alongside the softwoods. But the softwood planting is going to come rushing in. And I think that would be a shame if the softwood swept in on the back of the agribusiness. So you then had another sterile monoculture on top of what was the blasted wheat. But um, on the other hand, yeah, tree planting generally and at the tops of catchment and alongside, absolutely. And tree regeneration. I mean, it doesn't have to be planted. You can just let stand back and watch the things come up, you know. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, low, lower effort often, you know, slightly. Yeah, just, just fence it off from the from the grazing and you're there. Yeah, ten, ten, always seems a bit out of favour, less photo opportunities for politicians, I feel. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. 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 They like standing there with a spade sometimes, don't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a, that, there's a place for tree planting. I've planted a lot of trees in my time. Really? Um, we had we had a question. Um, you obviously covered elms there in terms of our environmental um, management schemes um, due to come up at that date in the future um, as we leave CAP and the European Union. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts. Um, the question was about will it be big enough, you know, to deliver and be competitive for farmers? I think was well. The answer is the jury is out. All this stuff is is unknown. It looks very promising. It's quite a long way off. Um, it has to be better than paying people just to go to plow everywhere. Um, but clearly, and, and it looks quite generous, but at the moment, people in the field, from what I'm seeing, are unable to do much negotiating on this kind of stuff with landowners because it's all frozen. There's so much uncertainty that at this actual moment in time, people don't know what uh, what it's going to mean in terms of of uh, pounds um, and, and money but um with the problems that i've outlined as well for farming that combined with payments should really should really take off i think and we've been talking just the last week to big farmers who are interested in doing dramatic things on landscape yeah not in your county i'm afraid to say north Ants. <laughs> Yeah, but there is a, there's still likely to be a lot of interest and depending on what they look at, you know, if it is about um, sort of natural flood management and things, then, you know, th there's still possibilities for us thinking about the Sauron Rico. Oh yeah, that's right. And, and land values are going to fall, which is very hard. On, on the, the poor old small farmers and medium-sized farmers are the ones that are going to suffer the most. Um, but I think if land values fall, there'll be a lot more hobby farmers. There is many hobby farmers now, as there are ordinary farmers. They don't farm as such big land because they would obviously not be very big, but they are a, a force to be reckoned with. And if you're a retired, elegant BBC executive from Islington and you decide to have horses in Rutland or something, well, jolly good, you know, and all the hedges can grow out. And I'm being very patronizing right on brilliant Leicester people as well. <laughs> One of the little follow-on questions that's just popped up is just about whether, you know, farmers will have to complete, compete for elms and things. And I suppose, well... I don't know. Th there's a whole system being created and trialled in the background. Mm. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's very so complicated and I, I don't know. There are, there are people who do, but I think even those who do don't really know how it will work yet. But principles there. 
yeah, I think watch this space and we'll see if we can communicate out a bit about what we know as it's yeah. involved. There's a number of trusts involved in those. And I mean, the trusts trusts, and, and Natural England are advising farmers all the time now and full on with that to give the backup to help farmers mm. make the shift into those kind of things. Something, yeah, I mean, you showed Thorn Moors there, which is a little bit close to my heart because I used to get lost in Thorn Moors. Yeah, dangerous place. <laughs> yeah, those big lowland landscapes are interesting places um, to try and get your bearings sometimes. But one of the questions that came in um, is a little bit of a hot topic again because of a, a Prime Minister's announcement. Um, it was a 10 step plan, which managed to miss Pete out of it and they have an easy win sat in front of them really which is about banning peat extraction and burning so yeah. i mean where would you see that sort of entering a package of sort of uh, yeah um, well there was one clause he saw in the bill that came up which is about purchase of um of you know, looking at and and the famous gardener made a comment and got unpopular didn't he what's his name Monty Don, um, of, of using peat in horticulture. And the thing about Thorn and Hatfield Moors is they were rescued and they've been put back to habitat. But in the middle of Hatfield, you can see the old peat works, which I remember when they were working peat, and it's full of bags of peat, which is being imported from Estonia and the Baltic from the raised mires of the of, of the edge and Finland in quantity, and yet it's bagged up and put in bags. And all it says on the, on the, a lot of the bags is uh, this, the peat here has been sustainably produced on some of the bags I've seen anyway, because you can tell that because it wasn't dug out of a site of special scientific interest. Well, it would be illegal to do that. So who's boasting? So actually, there's a job to be done. And Monty Don was jolly right. But of course, it's a real problem because the air to water ratio in a plant pot is hard to beat. Pete's very good stuff for that. So the horticulture industry will have to learn. There was a time when nobody had used the stuff. Yeah, and, and it gets, seems to go through phases, actually, doesn't it? I, I even did some research on sort of peat alternatives and then it seemed to all go out. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then they started allowing other extraction. Anyway, um, thinking about some other questions, obviously you hit on some of the, well, not just river engineering, but then the nat more natural solutions. Uh, and one of the obvious questions has just come up in the chat, which I was going to get to anyway. And some of your examples from sort of slowing the flow and things like that was remarkably similar to what beavers could do potentially. Oh, as well. yes. Yeah. Where, where, would, where would you see... A, some beavers sitting in some of the picture, obviously top of the, the sort of list, list within uh, the rewilding agenda. Yeah, well, in the right place. I mean, we've been looking at an area, um, possibly in Northamptonshire where you might, uh, uh, but maybe. But yes, I mean, it's, they're very successful. They're down in the West Country, they're going fine. I have a feeling you'd have to, um, fence them in a bit, otherwise you wouldn't want them on a dam just below your house where you were beside the brook, would you? Because otherwise there might be a problem. But it sounds as if they were, and sounds good. I'm less keen on the wolf, by the way, but still. <laughs> they had good impacts, didn't they, on, uh, on the rivers in Yellowstone, though? Um, yeah, but I don't think the Saw Valley were very good with wolves, but there'll be your members who don't agree with me, and they're welcome to, to right <laughs> call, call them up. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. I'm just looking through some, some of the other, obviously towards the end there, you, you were kind of talking about nature being the best advocate, you know, and understanding what, what's there, what, what could be perhaps. And so as my question would be, do you think we're not really listening enough and, and looking at that and then encourage it, allowing the others, you know, whether it's within the planning system or anything to actually understand, you know, what's there? Oh, well, of course. Uh, I mean, the Cameron administration uh, um, was absolutely atrocious with the natural England where the, the, the resources I think were cut down by two thirds. This is our government, uh, maybe, I'm, I, I can't tell you the precise, but it was a massive cut. Um, and uh, it was just 
appalling. We now have a very good chairman, Tony Juniper of Natural England, but he's inherited a sort of a bankrupt outfit, which has been asset stripped and cleaned out by a government that didn't care. Um, he's curious, isn't it, that maybe, with lots of fingers crossed, Boris and Co might just come to the rescue a bit but you know no we don't we don't uh, we don't care enough but we need to make sure that's why we need wildlife trusts and all that and uh, the caring is going to increase but the message that it's in our own interests it's not just pretty is surely what's got to really kind of yeah bite. yeah definitely and, and it's the age old thing isn't it you never quite know where politics is going to go there's a lot of um, very interesting support within the ranks of government. That doesn't mean to say it's able to operate that way. Well, it's the, yeah, it's the first time we've had much interest. And Michael Gove, you may hate him, but he's actually done more for, for than I can remember as Secretary of State when he was back in the environment for ages. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, hope for the best. But fight on. Join up, everybody. Tell your friends. Become members of the Wildlife Trust. Get out there.